Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are on the globe. I am back in Sun City West, as you can tell by my different backgrounds. Hi, Jen. Coach Jen is with us for our Facebook Live. And as is our normal, if you could just give a shout out and let us know that we have landed because we have such an important topic today. It, it, it appeals. To, it appeals. It doesn't appeal to anybody, but everybody experiences it. Yeah. We are talking about rejection today. Rejection. What does that look like and how do we move through rejection? Because all of us experience some form of rejection in our lives. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Tasha, for giving us a shout out so that we can know that we are live and we can move forward. How many of you have experienced a form of rejection in the last year? How many of you have experienced a form of rejection in the last year? Just put it in the chat. I have, I have, I have, and maybe you haven't, maybe you've had a good year, but um, I think one of the things I want to say is that all of us, all of us experience some form of rejection. Yes, 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 Tasha said. Have you experienced some sort of rejection in the last year? Yeah, it's universal. Jesus experienced rejection. Even God himself experiences rejection when we reject him when we don't want to spend time with him, when we don't want to pray, when we don't value what he has to say, when we don't value Jesus, when people aren't Christians. But even way back at the beginning of the beginning, God was rejected by Lucifer, his created angel. Lucifer rejected God. Hey, I think I want to be God, right? And so, so rejection is universal. Yeah, rejected by my son right now. Janie said no audio. Is everybody else having problems with audio or can you all hear us? It looks like you can hear us because we hear responses. So I'm assuming that we're good there for, for our end, Janie. It's something on your end. So check your uh, settings to make sure your volume is up. I have this problem all the time in different settings. So there's a volume control on your computer and there's a volume control usually right on Facebook that you have to lift up as well. All right. Everything is good. Audio is good. All right. So you're experiencing rejection right now. Maybe that's why you showed up. It's universal. We're going to have three key points here, and then we're going to answer your questions. It's universal. You, there's no pass from rejection in this world. We're going to get some. It's always painful. It's always painful because rejection hurts. It hurts our ego. It hurts our heart. It hurts our spirit. It feels bad. We all agree nobody feels good when they get rejected. All right. Okay, good. Yes, yes, I'm hearing the, I'm seeing the agreement that we're all on the same page. It is so painful. Some scientists say that, that um, rejection can be as painful as physical illness, like that emotional pain of rejection can be as painful as physical illness. But I want to share with you something that can make it painful, but even more painful if you do this. Okay, especially from family, Marina says, yes. Yes, agreed. So if you're rejected by somebody on social media that you don't know, <laughs> they call you some a name. If you're rejected by a, you know, somebody on a bus that doesn't want to share their seat with you, um, that's a whole different feeling than if you're rejected by a close relative, by your husband, by your mother, by your father, by your sister. That's much more painful. I feel rejection from my husband almost daily. Yeah, heartbreak. It's devastating. Let's, let me share with you something, and Jen and I were talking about this before, about how we make rejection more painful, which is what I want to help you do. It's always painful. Jesus felt the pain of rejection. But some of you are devastated, devastated by rejection. And this may be because you're adding a story to the reality to rejection. Jen, you want to start with what that story might be? Actually, I just want everyone just to sit with that for a second, because when we were talking about it, that's right. I, I just went, whoa, whoa, because I coach in this all the time. We all do. And we're also sisters and daughters of the king. And I just want everyone to just sit with that for a second. So we sometimes add to this story. So adding to the story are, it's, it's just all the things that we make up, right? So there's not only whatever we perceive as the rejection, which could be an obvious uh, turning of someone's back away from us. Like we think of the very observable, factual types of things that feel and are rejection. I don't like you. I don't love you. Uh, get away from me. Any of those types of words. But then what else do we play out into our head? Oh, I've never been lovable. 
I'm not worthy. Um, what am I supposed to do without this? We start taking on, I think, a whole bunch of things to try to fix it. So, yeah, I think there's a whole bunch that we add on, pile on, which feels very heavy to me. Mm -hmm. And we're faced with that. So let's play finish the story. Let's play finish the story. Yeah. Whoever your rejection partner is. It might be your mother. For some of you, I see it's your husband. So he rejects me. That means I'm what? Fill in the blank. I'm worthless. I'm a nobody. I'll never be loved again. There must have been something I did. Nobody ever will love me. <clears throat> I hate myself. I'm not good enough. Imagine how much more painful you will feel if you tell yourself that kind of story. Yeah, imagine how much more painful you will feel if you tell yourself this story. Tasha says, I struggle with which story to believe. I know from Christ, which is constant or the one that has been abusive and pushed into my thoughts for years. How to come overcome that ugly part of the story. Tasha, this is really important. The person who's to steward your thoughts is you, right? People can tell you stuff. You decide to believe it, right? So when God tells us that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, so it, he knows that bad stuff gets into our head, right? He knows that. But we have to like take out the trash every day, just like we have to in our house. If we don't take out the trash in our house every day, guess what's going to happen to our house? It's going to start to stink. We're like, why is the house stinking so bad? Because we didn't take out the trash, right? So we have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's why I'm asking you, what story are you thinking on? So yes, he rejected me. That's the truth. We want to walk in the truth. And that means what? Is that the truth? Maybe not. That's the thought that will cause tenfold more pain if you don't take out that piece of the trash, right? Mm -hmm. So Cheryl says, it's not me, it's them. The not good enough. The not good enough. Yeah. Daughter won't let me see my six-year-old granddaughter. Okay, that's extremely painful. And is there a story that you're telling yourself? That means I'll never get to see my six-year-old granddaughter. That means I'll never have a relationship with her. If you say that part of the story, you're going to feel a whole lot more sadder than right now, my daughter won't let me see my granddaughter. You don't know the future. But if you start predicting the future by your story, no one will ever love me again. Right? Yeah. Cheryl says, my mom rejected me. Yeah. Yeah. And let's see, she's jealous. She, uh, she's jealous of me and has shame about how she raised me. It has nothing to do with me. It's her guilt. Yeah, so I love that you said that, Cheryl. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that you have, uh, uh, and maybe it's not you, uh, probably hopefully it's not you, but we read this in the newspaper all the time. A pregnant woman is scared or she's mentally ill or she's not thinking straight in the moment and she gives birth to her child and instead of, giving it up for adoption or putting it in one of those little crates and put it in the fire department, whatever certain states have safe baby laws. She just puts it in a, a trash bag and throws it in the trash. Now, what does that say? She just rejected her baby. She puts it in the trash bag and puts it in the trash. What does it say about her? And what does it say about the baby? Put it in the chat. What does this, the baby is rejected. Yes, that's what it says about the baby. Right? What does it say about her? Understand that that baby is still a worthy, created in the image of God, precious baby that other people would want and love. It says nothing about the baby. It says something about the mother. Mm -hmm. She was scared. She was ill. She wasn't thinking straight. She was narcissistic. Who knows what it says? The mother was not capable. And instead of taking action to protect her baby, she just discarded it. Right? She just discarded it. So it's not about the baby. So understand when you experience rejection, it's not about your fundamental worthiness. It's still painful. The baby still may die in that trash bag. It's still painful. 
but it's not a statement about your value or your worth, right? I see it's making some of you mad, even the story that I'm telling. She should be in jail. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe she should be in a hospital. Mm -hmm. We don't know her story. Yeah. All we know is that her story is affecting this baby's story. But the baby's story, and it might end tragically, is not a fundamental statement about this child's worth. If your husband rejects you, whether he does it through right. adultery, whether he does it through pornography, whether he does it through divorce, whether he does it through verbal abuse or physical abuse, it's not a statement about you and that you're not a good wife or you're not valuable. You might not be valuable to him, right? If he's treating you like an object and the object isn't working anymore the way they want him to, I'm going to discard my cell phone too because fundamentally it's not my cell phone itself that I care about. It's what it does for me and it's easily replaceable. So if I reject my cell phone for a different cell phone, it's not a statement about my cell phone other than it doesn't work for me. But that's not how people are supposed to be in relationships. You're supposed to matter. And if you don't matter, it's not about you. It's not about you. Ah, Cindy said, oh my, oh my. I wonder if you had a, like an aha moment here. I had great difficulty getting along with my mom. I told myself, if I can't get along with my mom, how will I get along with other females? Yeah, that would impact your story, wouldn't it? Yeah. She wanted me to go to an all-girls high school, the same as she attended. Maybe you would have done just fine. Maybe you would have done just fine. Do you see how we can magnify the pain? And we can change the trajectory of our story. When we tell ourselves this negative story, helpless mom, but not hopeless baby. She needs lots of healing. Yeah. Yeah. My biological mother took an overdose of pills, but God still allowed me to be born and adopted. I found out years later she had mental issues. My heart hurt for you. JD, my mom had mental issues too, and she was very abusive physically, emotionally to me. And as I grew older, I certainly had a lot of compassion on how hard it was for her to function, let alone be a mother, single mom in those days of three kids. But it still had its impact on me, but it wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. And once I could separate that, I was able to thrive and heal and become my better self. Instead of feeling like, why my mom does not love me? You know, why would my mom abuse me? I must be a horrible kid. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. If your husband is treating you horribly, it's not about you. If your adult children are treating you horrible, it's not about you. You might have done something that angered them, but they could have handled it in a much more healthy way. It's not about you. And that's helpful to not go down into the terrible pits of despair when you are rejected because rejection hurts. Yeah. Beth Moore talks a lot about that too. I remember from a study years ago, so I cannot think of the book title right now, but we talk about in that study. Anyway, she talks about going into the pit, being in the pit. And if you initially, at least for me, if you picture a pit, it's probably dark and dirty and deep and just yucky and dripping with whatever and goodness knows what he even smells like. But what she also talks about when we think about rejection is we start decorating the pit. So we're in it. And then we start like actually making it feel comfortable and nice. And I think sometimes we fall into that too, depending on how long we've been in this situation, whether it be with our husbands in marriages or maybe like childhood. Mm -hmm. um, I see a couple of comments in there, at least a couple where it says, uh, one of the things they say to themselves is I am too much. Yes. I saw that. That's, that's, you know, it looks like we're owning it, but when I hear the word too, as in T O O, that's a judgment statement. That's giving a level of quantification to something too much compared mm -hmm. to what, to mm -hmm. who I'm guessing right now, you're not too much to Leslie and I, <laughs> not <Yeah>. at all. <laughs> so you know, we want to make sure we don't start decorating that pit and then it gets a little comfy. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So let's take the too much example. So we're going to give you an illustration of too much. All right. And how this works, because you might be too much for them. That doesn't mean you're not good. You might be perfect just the way you are. So I want you to put in the chat, all of you, if you were um, going to 31 flavors for ice cream today, and you were allowing yourself an ice cream treat, if some of you may not eat ice cream, um, what flavor would you choose? Out of all 31 flavors, what flavor would you choose? Put it in the chat. 
if you were to go to this has a point with rejection. So if you were to go to 31 flavors and you had 31 flavors to choose from, you can't pick them all. What flavor would you pick? Okay. Kathy says butter pecan. What about the rest of you? Butter pecan, chocolate mint chip, rainbow sherbet, lemon, bubble gum, chocolate walnut. Oh, this is amazing. Chocolate almond. Yeah. Put in the chat. There's more oh, of you we here. Haven't, we, we haven't had a repeat yet. <laughs> yeah, I know. Coffee and dark chocolate. Chelsea, I'm with you. Chocolate brownie with nuts and caramel swirl. Strawberry, cookies and cream. Blueberry cheesecake. This is amazing how many different ones. Chocolate and black cherry. Okay. Cherry's Jubilee. <laughs> cookies and cream is a second repeat. Okay. Rocky Road. Cherry vanilla, people. Come on. I <laughs> Moose tracks. Pistachio almond. All right. Rocky Road. All right. We have my all-time favorite mint chocolate chip. Today, I want Villanelle with strawberries. All right, coffee, coffee chip. All right, so I want you to imagine this, that when some hot guy walks into, so all of you are the flavor you pick. That's who you are. So your mint chocolate chip, your blueberry cheesecake, your uh, lemon sorbet, whatever the different daiquiri ice, the other flavors that you picked, amaretto, those are your, that's who you are. And some hot, hot guy walks into 31 flavors and he says, oh, wow, there's so many good looking ice creams here. Hmm. But you know what? I always pick vanilla. I am just a vanilla guy. And all of you are saying to yourselves who aren't vanilla, I'm too much. I'm too much. You are too much. You aren't vanilla. Don't try to be vanilla just because somebody wants vanilla, if you're not vanilla, right? Okay. If your cookies and cream or your mint chocolate chip, be the best mint chocolate chip that you can possibly be. So when a guy or a gal walks in and says, oh, I like mint chocolate chip, you're going to taste wonderful to them, not to somebody who wants vanilla. And so when they say, oh, you're too much, you might be for a vanilla guy. That's why it's so important, ladies, that you don't fake who you are to try to attract somebody because you're going to attract the wrong person. And the person may feel like you're too much because they didn't want cookies and cream. They wanted vanilla. All right. So your work to do is to grow into the person you're to be, the best version of your self. And if you get rejected, this is a perfect opportunity for you to start doing your own work instead of trying to be what they want so they don't reject you. You can't be what everyone wants or you will be nothing but a chameleon. And that is not who God called you to be. So rejection is an opportunity for you to take stock of how you've been showing up in relationships. And if you've been a chameleon, over-accommodating, people-pleaser, oh, you like vanilla? I'll be vanilla. Oh, you like strawberry? I'll be strawberry. You're exhausting yourself and you're living an inauthentic life and eventually you will get rejected because you cannot live up to that. You cannot live up to what you're not. Your work, a sunflower cannot be a rose no matter how much it tries. Its job is to be the most beautiful, strong, perky little sunflower it can be. And people who want roses in their bouquet are not going to pick you. And it's not because you're not beautiful. It's because they wanted roses. And if you can learn to think of it that way, you're not going to fit with everybody. For some people, you're going to be too much. Other people, you're going to not be enough. I would never in a million years pick vanilla ice cream. It's not enough for me. I want some other stuff in it. If I'm going to eat that many calories, I want a bunch of stuff in it. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so everybody is different. And it's okay for you to be who you are. Because that's your holy calling. Is to be the best version of you. Not to be what some other guy wants you to be or some other gal wants you to be, including your own mother. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of women who've gone through our ministry whose mothers have wanted a different kind of girl than she was and have made you feel ashamed of who you were because you didn't measure up to her ideal of the perfect daughter. You weren't interested in dresses and frills and 
you know, dance lessons. You wanted to go play soccer and you wanted to wear shorts and you weren't the kind, you were introverted and you wanted to read books and it didn't fit with your family and you were somehow shamed. Be who God made you to be. And you will get rejected. But if you're good with you, you understand that when somebody comes into the ice cream parlor, not everybody likes your flavor. And it's okay. It's okay. Caramel turtle fudge. I've never had that, but that sounds pretty darn good. If it's anything like the actual chocolates, I'm in. <laughs> so Sherry says, I'm not familiar with the I'm too much expression. What does that mean exactly? So it might be that you're too extroverted. You're too, I remember a woman who was an extreme extrovert um, and I went to church with her. She was an extreme extrovert. She was the kind of mom who was like, woo, woo, woo with the games. And she was overly friendly. If she were worshiping in church, she'd be raising her hands and she'd be the first to run to the altar. And she married a very introverted guy. And because he was the head of the house and he was her covering and all of that, Back then, um, she was too much. She was too loud. She was too assertive. She was too happy. She was too everything for him, too noisy. And over the years, I saw her move from this to this. Mm -hmm. She was completely squashed by him because he told her she was too much and she believed it. She wasn't too much. She was too much for him. He picked her and she probably was very outgoing in her dating time. And then he proceeded to define her. And so this is the third point I want to talk about in our rejection thing. First is it's painful for everybody. Second is you can make up a story about it to make it more painful. Like it, this means, this means I'm not worth it. This means I'm too much. This means I'm not enough. All of that. Third is Rejection is an opportunity for you to ask yourself, who am I supposed to be? And I'm not going to appeal to everyone, just like not every ice cream appeals to every person. doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you should switch flavors. It means you should be the ice cream that you were made to be. But the fourth point that I want to talk about, and I was just talking to Jen about this before our, our, we opened, and I was uh, thinking about this this weekend. You know, when the fall came, our humanity, our essence of who we are, image bearers. We are God's image bearers, was not damaged. We are still God's image bearers. But was, what was damaged was some of our humanity. And the part of our humanity that was damaged, instead of, and Adam and Eve damaged it, instead of looking to God as their source for everything, mm -hmm. which is how he created them, limited human beings, they needed God, mm -hmm. they chose the tree of life because Satan tempted them with, you can know everything, you can be like God, you don't need God anymore, you can be God. And so what we've done in our fallen humanity is we've looked to other sources for our sense of self. Am I worth it? Am I worthy? And God tells us this in Romans 1. They have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. This is our source. And they have bent into and worshipped the creation and created things. And I think, ladies, one of the reasons we are so devastated by re rejection is that we have put man as our source of well-being. If I don't have a man, I'm not worth as much. If I don't have a man that loves me like it does in the movies or in my books that I'm reading, I'm not worth as much. My source, I've become a man-centered woman, a husband-centered woman instead of a God-centered woman. And we've kind of thought that was biblical, but it's not. It's a distortion of our consequences of the fall. And so, ladies, one of the other lessons from rejection is, whoa, I've put all of my well-being in this human being's basket. I've put my definition of who I am in his hands. That's idolatry. God says he gets to define you. He's your creator. He's the one who made you. He's the one who knows you the best. He's the one who loves you the most. He gets to define who you are, and you are beloved. You are a sunflower. And if your husband doesn't like sunflowers or you are a watermelon, if your husband doesn't like whatever God made you to be, be it. If he doesn't like it, don't change who you are. That would be sinful. Be who God made you to be, the best version of you. 
What are some thoughts about this? Is this helping you process rejection? We worship man over God, understanding that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We say, I, you know how um, Leah, I must have his love or I will die. When Jacob married her sister, Rachel loved her more. He didn't love Leah. He loved, he got conned into marrying Leah. And so Leah tried to be what he wanted. I'll just have babies. I'll pop them up one after another. Now he'll love me. If you read the text, after this baby, now he'll love me. After this baby, now he'll love me. After this baby, now he'll love me. He still didn't love me. <laughs> he didn't love her. Finally, finally, she says, I know God loves me. Finally, she learned through rejection that God loves her. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, Jen? I'm going to ask uh, questions, but any thoughts? That you yeah, have? This is, no, this is good. And I'm watching the chat. And so I'm I'm hearing and watching um, our listeners just connecting so well, because I think as we get caught up in this world and it is easy, like you even said earlier, to get rejected by the person that might not give up their seat on the bus. I know it's not the same intensity, right? but I think it's on the same level of some sort, right? The emotion is rejection. It's, it's like two magnets where they repel mm -hmm. something like that. So all of that is real. And I think you're speaking very deeply, not only into the worldly sense of what it is we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, but then how we can tap into the spiritual aspect and help us put things into perspective, Leslie, that's what you're doing is, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that, God loves us. There were major things that happened in heaven that have led us to who we are today. And we're still not rejected. We're yeah. still not rejected by our Lord. And I'm so grateful. So grateful. Yeah. Rhonda says, yes. And I want to get me back. Good, good. You're yeah. so good saying I'm squat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would just encourage you if this is helpful and you want to kind of do a deep dive, not deep dive, like a 10 inch dive on mm -hmm. Just you, who am I and how do I work? I would encourage you to join our challenge. We're going to do a five-day challenge next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of next week. I'll put some information on the screen here about it where you can sign in. And it's called the Moving Beyond Challenge. Moving Beyond Challenge, you can sign up at lesliebarnick.com forward slash challenge. So let me explain what this challenge is going to be, and then we're going to open it up to questions about rejection or the challenge if you want. So day one, next Monday, we're going to talk about how do we overcome overwhelm? How do we move beyond overwhelm? Many of us feel overwhelm a lot. Just now, you might be feeling some overwhelm, like, oh my gosh, I just heard things that I didn't know before, and how do I... How do I have some time to process this? How do I deal with the overwhelm of emotions that might be coming up, realizing I've allowed myself? You know, we we had that I was at Lisa Turkhurst's event this last weekend, and we were I was each group I I worked with, I said, Hey, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. You got a light when you were born. This little light of mine, I'm not gonna let anyone blow it out or put it under a bushel or squash my wick. <laughs> Ladies, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And if you've not known how to do that, we're going to give you some tools this next week. So Monday, moving beyond overwhelm, whether it's overwhelm in your external world, like my house is a mess and I've got papers everywhere and I don't know how to start. Or if it's overwhelmed with lots of different things in your external world, like marriage and house and kids, and how do we sort through all that? How do we prioritize all that? Or is this overwhelming your emotions? We're going to talk about that Monday, next Monday. So we're going to have, this is how it's going to go. If you sign up for the challenge, it is $23 because we want people to have some skin in the game because we're giving lots of our time, lots of our tech team here. So $23 to join for all five days, not for one day, all five days. So it's about $5 a day, $6 a day, not much. All right. And you can get an email in the morning. It'll say, hey, everybody in the challenge. Hey, Leslie, you're in moving beyond overwhelm day one. Here's what I want you to do. And I'm going to give you some instructions on a piece of paper in email so that you see them first thing in the morning. Then I want you to actually practice it. Do what I'm telling you to do right then, right there as best you can. It might not be that you can do it right that second, but do it that first day. And then we're going to get on Facebook Live 
not on this Facebook channel. You're going to be invited to a completely new Facebook that we just set up for this challenge alone. It's private. Only people who are on the challenge get to be on that Facebook page. So it's not public so that you can feel freer to say some things that you need to say. And then I'll be on there. I'll be on there for an hour with one of my coaches on Monday to talk about what you learned as you did your homework and where you got stuck. And we'll specifically focus on emotional overwhelm on our Monday's call. That Facebook Live will be at 4 p.m. Eastern time, and it will be recorded if you can't make it live, and it'll be for one hour. Okay, day two, we're going to be talking about moving beyond negative thinking. Just like we talked about, what's the story you tell yourself? What's the story that you tell yourself? And do you know that when you tell yourself a negative story like this, my child died. And it's all my fault, right? Her child died. He was hit by a car. He's riding his bike. That's bad enough. That pain is bad enough. But then she told herself it's my fault because I shouldn't have let him out to play that day, right? right? So she was telling herself a story about what happened that made her pain exponentially worse. She was not just feeling the grief of losing a child, which is enormous, but the guilt on top of that just sunk her to the bottom. You have to learn to recognize and separate the truth from the story. Sometimes there's truth. I got abused as a child, and that means my life is ruined. No, it doesn't. But if that's what you tell yourself, imagine the mood you're going to be in, right? So we're going to talk about that and how to figure that out, how to separate the truth from the story, and understand how the story is impacting your mood so that you can change that and do something different. So that'll be day two. You'll get the same thing, a new email the next morning with some tools on how to do it. And then I will be on Facebook Live at noon, just like today, noon Eastern time, and that's day two. Day three, how many of you have not done something you know you need to do that maybe God's calling you to do, that he's calling you in your chocolate chip ice cream, or he's calling you in your butterfly self, your true self, to do something exciting, but it's also pretty darn scary, and you're afraid of failing. And so you stay stuck. How do we move beyond the fear of failing? Even confronting your husband on some things, and you're afraid it's not going to go well. Mm -hmm. How do we move beyond the fear of failure? That will be our topic for Wednesday. Same thing, you'll get an email with some instructions, some homework that we want you to do, and then we will be on Facebook Live in the evening, 7.30, for those of you who might work during the day, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Again, these will all be recorded. They will be in that people-pleasing, and not in, the, in that Moving Beyond Challenge um, Facebook page, so you can watch them anytime you want. And then Thursday, we are going to talk about how do we move beyond unrealistic expectations? How many of you have a few of those? Like... I just expect him to love me. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with it, except for it might be unrealistic knowing your husband. I just want him to be honest with me. Again, nothing wrong with that. It's reasonable. It's just not realistic knowing your husband. How do I move beyond that? And what do I do? If I accept it, I don't want to accept it. Oh, how do we talk about that? So if that's you, give you some tools on how do we move beyond that so we can live in truth and reality and not what should be because it should be doesn't happen sometimes, right? So how do we move beyond that? Same thing, email in the morning, Facebook Live, that will be at noon Eastern time as well. And then Friday, we're gonna do our big one, which is probably true for all of you. How do I move beyond people pleasing? Because this is the mother load of morphing into someone else. This is the mother lo load of saying, oh, you want vanilla? I'll be vanilla in order to make you happy. I will, I will morph myself, I will turn myself upside down, I will exhaust myself, I will compromise my values and my morals just so that you're not mad at me, just so that you like me, just so that you think I'm good and wonderful. I will squash me, compromise me, devalue me, and exhaust me in order to do what you want so that you will like me. This is huge for Christian women, and we actually think it's a virtue to do it. I will sacrifice me to please you, and that may not be healthy for either one of you, so how do we move beyond people-pleasing? Doesn't mean you can't still people-please, but you do it from a completely different place. You do it from generosity and love and not fear that he's going to reject me or be mad at me if I say no. This is true for so many Christian women, and we've been taught to kind of, that's a virtue to do that, and it's not. 
People pleasing is wonderful if you can do it from a good yes. But if you find yourself exhausted and resentful, then that means you're doing it from fear. You're doing it from, if I don't do it, they're going to be mad at me and I can't handle that. If I don't do it, they're going to reject me and I can't handle that. If I don't do it, they're going to be disappointed with me and I can't handle it. Well, this is where you have to learn to handle it because people will use you, abuse you, and manipulate you if you can't say no. And so the last day, moving beyond people pleasing. Again, first thing in the morning, you will get some instructions on how you might learn to do that. And it's deeper than just learning to say no. And then we will meet together at noon Eastern time again and talk about that and coach you through that. So I will always be together with one of our coaches and we will coach you through your questions after you've done the homework. So this is an intensive, not yeah. hours long, but it's an intensive for you to really do some personal work right now for yourself so that you are less vulnerable when you get in life that's hard and people are difficult or even destructive. Anything you want to add about the challenge, Jen? Oh, I just, I love it. I've been blessed to be able to work on it last summer and got introduced to it even the summer before that. This is um, something you don't want to miss. It really is everything that Leslie's talking about. So informative and intense. So, and what we mean by that is is not to, to feel even, well, I kind of hope you're a little bit scared in a good way. <laughs> Meaning that there's like something I need to do differently or whatever. It Yes, you do, because this is a commitment and it's not a commitment so much of dollars, but we want you to feel like it's important enough to you. It's a commitment of your time, mm. of your energy, and it's a commitment to the other sisters that will be in this group because of the private Facebook page and information that goes back and forth. So mm. we want all of us to respect the journey that we're, are, we are on for ourselves, but I think for the journey that others are on as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that combined makes it so powerful. Maybe that's a better word, powerful. Yeah, and when you do it with a group of women who are also doing it, it's so fun. It's fun because yeah, yeah. you don't feel like you're all struggling in the same five areas. These are five specific areas. I've given you that ahead of time. I've, I've given you what we're doing. So if you if that's you, $23 is not a big investment. Mm -hmm. It's like fast food lunch for a family. It's not even that. All right. So $23 and five hours of your time, one hour Monday, one hour two for the Facebook lives. And if you can't make them live, they are recorded, but you have to also do your homework that you get in the morning. There is a tool that we're going to give you each day and we want, and we'll show you how to practice it if you didn't quite understand it in the writing part of it, but I will write it all out for you. Print those emails out, put them in a notebook, practice mm -hmm. them. The more we practice using our tools, whatever tools we have, whether it's a garden hoe or whether it's a paintbrush or whether it's a Jinsu knife or whatever tools you use in your life, when we have tools to manage our emotions and our thoughts, and when we have tools to deal with our relationship struggles, we are a more mature person, especially if we can use our tools wisely. Doctors practice using their tools, their scalpel, their stethoscope, their ear thing, and all of the things that they use. They have to practice them as nurses do and other people who use tools. I'm going to give you some spiritual and mental health tools. Our team is going to give you some tools to use for your growth, for your maturity, for your welfare. Because I know one thing for sure. It is God's will for you to mature and grow so that you are a light to the world. Jesus says not just he's the light, you're the light. But if you're letting other people blow your candle out because you're afraid to make them unhappy or you're afraid they're not going to want you or you're afraid to confront them and do the things that you need, you will be overwhelmed. You will be filled with negative thoughts and feelings. You will be afraid of failure. And that's not at all who God wants you to be. So please join us and you can invite a friend. This isn't just for people who follow me. You can invite another girlfriend that maybe has never heard of us. Just give her the link and she can join as well. Um, we would love to help Christian women. We will be using Christian principles, just like we talked about today. So we will help Christian women and people who aren't opposed to those values um, learn to be healthier in your inner world as well as in your outer world. Yeah, how can I join if I don't have Facebook? Two things you can do. One is you can join Facebook for a week. 
and you know, just join it and then quit Facebook afterwards. So you can join Facebook for a week. And if you want to do that, contact our staff and we will help you do that. Um, you can join Facebook for as long as you want to. Um, and then just don't even get on regular Facebook, just join Facebook, get on our private Facebook page. And then when you're done, get off Facebook. That would be what I would recommend. But even if you choose not to do the coaching part of it, if you just get the emails every day, um, that will help you. It won't help you as much if you don't participate in the coaching sessions. So the hour long sessions are to specifically coach you through struggles or questions that you have about the instructions you got in the email. So that part you would miss. But even if you missed the live and you joined Facebook and then you just watch the replays afterwards on that Facebook page and then just delete your Facebook account and sign out of Facebook and that's it. And if again, if you don't know how to um, contact assistant at lesliebarnick.com and they will help you learn to join Facebook for this challenge. Okay. Can I get it later if I'm not on secret Facebook? You cannot get this challenge if you don't join the challenge. So if you join the challenge, you get all the emails and you get access to the secret Facebook page and the coaching. The secret Facebook page will stay live so that if you didn't get a chance to watch it all that week, you can go back and watch the recording even after the challenge is over. It just won't be live and we won't be on there. Some people, some participants still may be on there. Uh, we've had participants from previous challenges stay on there for quite a bit of time to support each other in you know little conversations on the Facebook page. But I, I, our team will not be on there any longer after the first week. Okay, we're going to move on actually to do a coaching group on people pleasing. So if that's your Achilles heel and you kind of defend that, define that as you, oh, I need to learn to stop being an unhealthy people pleaser, then we're going to be doing a six week intensive coaching group for people who want some more help with that. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I'm going to read a question here, Jen. I'll let you answer it. Finding me again. Finding me again after morphing and suppressing for so long is proving more difficult than I would have thought. I did the moving beyond challenge and I will again, but I'm still having trouble moving forward. Instead, I'm on the treadmill. Any ideas to help her find me again? Yeah, I, I'm just glad you're, you're still here because I think you're on a quest for something. And I think that also shows the faith you have and what information is out there, what the Lord can bring to you as well. So I encourage you to stay and continue because as Leslie's heard me say a million times, and I think all of you can probably relate to, is there's a scripture, I'm guessing, and if you even want to put it in the chat, a scripture that all of a sudden hit you and blew your mind. You've read it 50,000 times. Your pastor has preached about it. A thousand times. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, God's speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And, so yeah, and keep talking. I'm going to go get something and I'll be right back because I want to show yeah. her something. Yeah. Okay. So I'm suspecting that there's, uh, not suspecting, meaning I have faith that right now this is your opportunity. And I think I'm seeing others in the chat as well that have had the opportunity to be a part of this challenge previously I swear you will learn something from the different women, from the different coaches, from something like even from me as one of the coaches, I just speak from the heart. I speak from wherever the Lord downloads to me at that moment. So I encourage you to recognize and honor. Okay. I'm on that treadmill. Now what needs to be different? What do I need to do to get off this? What is speaking to me? What have I maybe I thought wasn't speaking to me differently, but it kind of gave me a little bit of an inkling. Those are all, I think, little taps on the shoulder from the Lord that we have to learn to listen to and that we deserve to hear so that we can take our next best steps forward. And so that's what I would encourage you to do, because that's moving forward. So the treadmill feel like may feel like you're doing the same thing, but there's still one step in front of the other. If you picture looking at the screen, which a lot of treadmills have, right? That's still looking forward. Your eyes are still up there. So keep them up there. Keep looking for what the Lord is speaking to you, whether it's in this program or the other sisters that have to speak to you, even on the Facebook chat today through here, all the comments, everything that Leslie's saying is rock solid. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> So I'm going to give you some tools and, and, and we're going to give you tools and that and tools, biblical tools. 
I, I'm hearing that God says Bible study friends think we should suffer. I'm going to address that in just a minute. But we have tools to use, but we don't use those tools very well. So you got some tools last year in the challenge of how do I become me? How do I grow into me? But I'm pretty old now, and I have grown more in the last 10 years into me, more comfortable than I've ever felt before in my life. So I don't think it ends. I think it's a process of maturing. God calls us. We're never going to be finished yet. Paul says, I haven't arrived yet. How do we become how do we become fully what God called us to be is a lifelong journey. So don't think you're going to arrive at 40 or 45. It's not going to happen. So I'm going to show you a picture. So I have paintbrushes. I was just in um, North Carolina and I met with some women who listened to me on Facebook, some Conquer friends, and they gave me a gift of paintbrushes. And I said, oh, I could use some new paintbrushes. So I've been practicing my painting and some of you have seen pictures. And so this is a painting that I did, oh, how many years ago? Probably five years ago, right? It's not bad, but you're, there's some distortions. Her eyes are too big. They're too close together. Uh, her face is weird. And, you know, her hair is okay. I mean, it's not bad. It's not, not a horrible picture, but that's my skill level at using my paintbrushes, okay? But I've been taking classes for the last five years. And so this is a painting I did last summer. And it's a little bit more accurate. It's a little bit more funky in certain ways that I like to do kind of funky pictures. But so I'm getting better with my tools, but I'm still learning and I'm still taking and I, same paintbrushes, same paintbrushes, different picture yeah. because I'm more skilled with my tools. And so as you get the tools of life, how do I learn to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? How do I learn to guard my heart above all else? How do I learn to be a God-centered woman instead of a man-centered woman? What do I do with my emotions that are threatening to take over my entire life? These are, these are tools that we have to practice to use. And I'm much better at them this year than I was five years ago, my emotional tools. Also my paintbrush tools, but that was just an example to show you that the more you practice using your tools, the better you get. So I've been practicing these tools for five years and you can see the progress. It's not bad at one level, but it's better at another level. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give you the basics of the tools and teach you how to work with them. And I find for me, I do better when I'm in a class. So I take painting classes really regularly because I need people who are ahead of me to show me how to use the tools better. And that's what we offer. And that's what we help you with. I love that. I mean, that's what coaching is all about. And I think we've seen some people in the comments already talk about the previous experience that they've had and they're looking forward to it again, or they're encouraging others right now to participate because mm -hmm. tools are, I guess, that way that God just enabled us on this earth to be able to cope and move forward and advance the kingdom. And so I'm always grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you for giving us those tools. Yeah, so I'm going to look at a couple questions here. I'm just going to answer real quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I love the idea. Is there a limit to the number of participants? There's not a limit to the number of participants in the challenge because we'll just do that like we do Facebook Lives. You know, so far, there's probably, you know, number a couple of hundred, you know, 900 people signed up for the challenge so far. Mm -hmm. So um, we will do it to whoever shows up. Not everybody will show up, but that's how many people are signed up right now uh, for all five days. But after that, when we offer you, hey, if this particular issue, people pleasing is a problem for you and you want to be in a small group of intensive work on this for six weeks, that will be limited. So we will have only 25 people in a group. Um, and so that's where we all work on the same thing, but you have five, 25 people working on the same thing with a coach specifically assigned to that 25 person group. And we will tell you about that on Friday of the challenge, but that's what we do. So that was one question. And then the other person had a question on suffering. And I just want to talk about that just real quickly mm -hmm. because sacrificial suffering is a Christian virtue, but here's where we make a mistake. We, God calls us to, for example, he says, no greater love has someone than this, that they lay down their life for a friend. So that's a sacrifice. If I'm going to lay down my life for Jen, then that's a sacrifice. I was my, uh, my Uber driver while I was traveling. He had a friend who gave him a kidney. That was a sacrificial gift. Give you one of your healthy kidneys. You only get two. So I'm going to give you one because you don't have any. And he was just so grateful for this sacrificial friend. Mm -hmm. So 
I gave him, a, he gave him a kidney so that he would have life, right? And so if you give up your life so that someone has life, that's a worthy sacrifice. Or if you give up your life or you give up something in order to better someone else in their well-being, that's not, that's not a bad thing. If you give up your life or you give up something or you sacrifice or suffer in order to enable someone to be more selfish, in order to able, enable someone to be more wicked, in order to enable someone to be more sinful, that's a foolish decision. God isn't asking you. In fact, he tells you specifically in Ephesians 5, do not participate in any way in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Rather, expose them. Well, that's a sacrifice, isn't it? If you have to expose some of your husband's hidden deeds of darkness to the church for some church discipline or for some support and help for you, oh, that's scary, isn't it? That might enable sacrifice. I remember a woman who called the police when her husband was abusing her. And that was sacrificial because now he's in jail. He's not going to work. But she did it for his welfare. So that's how we've twisted. We've, caught, we've been enablers. Lisa Turker says it best. She said, God is not calling us to sacrifice the best of who you are to enable the worst in someone else's life. Yeah. That's not helping them. That's not even if it's your husband. That's not being a good helpmate. That's hurting him. It's like giving him cocaine if he's a crack addict. Why would you do that? That's hurting him. Saying no, that's a sacrifice because he's going to be mad at you. He might even leave you, right? He might, he might throw a fit and you're going to be in all of that stuff. But saying no, I'm not enabling your dysfunction to continue mm -hmm. is the sacrifice. So understand that we've been taught as Christian women wrongly on that. It's God doesn't, God doesn't value the sanctity of marriage, keeping it together at all costs, at any price, at the price of you and your children's safety and sanity. That's too high a price to enable a dysfunctional man to have the perks of marriage. And you just sacrifice yourself and your children's future and health. Too high a price. God is not asking you to pay that price. We're not doormats. Yeah. We are not doormats. <laughs> we're not doormats and we're, we're image bearers. We're yeah. image bearers. And Jesus gave his life not to his abusers. There were plenty of places in scripture where he escaped from his abusers. When they were trying to throw him off a cliff, he escaped. He didn't give his life to his abusers. He got abused as he was doing something for our welfare. He was laying down his life for our salvation. Very specific reason for our good. For our good. Not just to allow the Pharisees to kill him. That wasn't the point. So um, let's see if we have any other questions. I hope that helps you in terms of finding yourself. It's a process. And I would just encourage you to continue your work. Continue your work. All right, any other questions that you have for us on rejection? If I don't do it, I'll get the smear campaign. She's so selfish. She's so controlling. Yeah. That, if you read the Bible, that happened. <laughs> it happened to David. It happened to Nehemiah. You will get the smear campaign. Yeah. So do you bow into that so that you don't get the smear campaign? Or do you say, hey, I can't control you. I can only control me. I'm the one who has to live with who I am. I am not compromising my integrity out of fear of what you might say about me, right? That's that fear of failure. I'm going to do what I have to do, even if it doesn't work, even if it doesn't, even if the outcome isn't what I thought it would be, I know I showed up as I was supposed to show up. I can't control you. I can only control me. I can't control my children. I can only control me, my side of the street, being a good mom. I can't control whether you listen to me or obey me. I can't control that ultimately, right? Yeah. And hey, if we fight fire with fire, so to speak, it's like, let's fight that rejection with rejection. I am not going to claim that. I will not let you, well, you can, I'm not going to say you're letting someone, but I'm not going to accept that that's what you say about me. If that's what you do, then this is where I am over here. And I will stand strong with who I am in the Lord and I will fight it. I will fight it. Well, and I think this is really important. People are going to say things about you just like they said things about Jesus. I mean, if you look at the scriptures in one chapter alone in Mark, he had three different accusations. First, well, first of all, in I can't remember what chapter, like Mark three, somewhere around there. It says, everything you do is wonderful. Oh, you're so wonderful, Jesus. And then the next chapter it says, and the Pharisees thought he was demon possessed. 
Right. And his family thought he was out of his mind, right? So which is it? Yes, people are going to accuse you of things that aren't true. Jesus got accused of things that weren't true. Nehemiah got accused of things that weren't true. Jeremiah got things accused. Paul got accused of things that were not true. Is it your job to defend yourself or is it your job? I would correct the narrative if it's important and where you need to with people who are important to you. Sure. But you cannot control what other people say. Yeah. You can only show your character and let people decide for themselves. And people who really matter will come to you privately and say, your husband said that you had an affair. Is that true? Or your husband says, and, and you're going to say, no, that's what he does when he gets hurt and disappointed. And no, I did not have an affair. Right. But you don't have to put it in Facebook. Everybody, I did not have an affair. He's just lying about me. I mean, it just makes it look icky. And that's not who you are. You don't have to do that. Yeah. I've always loved that phrase, Leslie, um, what you think of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it speaks true to rejection. Yep. 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 I'm seeing, I'm seeing some really great aha moments mm -hmm. here in the chat. So I'm really happy for that, but I don't see a ton of questions. No. So I, yeah. So anybody, I have been accused of being a witch. Yeah. I've been accused of being the other thing with a B word. <laughs> Not yep. by anybody who cares about me, but just for speaking up for women. Like I've yes. been, you know, I've been accused of being other things and, you know, it is what it is. I'm, I know who I am. And I think that's the most important thing. My heart is clean before the Lord. If there's a, a, if someone says something about me that might resonate a little bit, I always go before the Lord and say, Lord, is that true of me? Is that something you're trying to, you know, tell me through even a donkey of somebody I might not respect. Are you trying to tell me? Because there might be some truth to that. But other times I just, that is part of the price you pay when you say things people don't like mm -hmm. is they will try to shut you down by making you feel shamed, mm -hmm. right? That's an age old tactic is yeah. shame you to silence you, right? And I don't feel, I don't feel, I don't, I don't buy that anymore. I see what's happening and I just don't let them control me. I just, I control me, right? Yeah. I put a question in above. So I'm not, I'm only, see, Amanda, Amanda, can you send us the questions if you see any? Because I don't see any questions here. Yeah. If you, if repeat your question then if we can't find it, because obviously we can't find it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes. Because we've got a few more minutes. Are you have a hard stop at 10, Jen? I do. I do actually, or shortly after, just a couple minutes after. Okay. But um, I was just also looking at something so... You know, when we think about the B word or someone says I've been accused of being a witch or something like that, I think, again, from almost like a, a worldly sense or if we can give, I don't want to say like a script back to say to these people, but at least just step back. And as we said at the beginning of our call today, don't take it personally. Look where that's coming from. Because especially when we're accused of things as significant of being a witch, for example, it, I question what their belief system may be. So not without judgment, just how it's different than mine. And if that's how they see me, I'm learning and have learned to take a step back and go, what does that really say with them? Mm -hmm. And what are their belief systems? And okay, they're different than mine. Doesn't mean I am rejected. They're rejecting maybe how I'm showing up or what they believe to be true or what all ice cream should be. Right. Um, you know, that kind of idea. So I know those types of accusations are extremely significant. I do. And we know that we know how personal this can feel. And I think one of the most almost confusing, if I dare say, cause I know that's the word of an enemy of the enemy but one of the most confusing things I ever had said to me when I was first walking out of my D-Day as being rejected by my husband when I learned um, he had been so unfaithful was the fact that um, this wasn't personal. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> this could not feel any more personal. And that's the story. Like Leslie was saying earlier is that because I just piled on everything. How, how can this not be personal? But when I was able to take a step back and see who I am in the Lord and remind myself of who I am in the Lord, because he never went away. It was me that backed off while I questioned all this stuff. 
that's where I recognize this wasn't personal. So I just want to remind everybody that's listening right now that it's not as personal as you think or believe or make up and to keep those things in check just a little bit. And that's what we're here for too, is to have safe people to bounce this off of. If you are questioning, is it me or is it him? Should I feel rejected? Did I actually do something worth rejecting? I don't know. Maybe you did, but it's not personal. Maybe just the thing. Yeah. And I think that so we can look at things and I've, I've drawn this chart before, but internal, external. Mm -hmm. So when he says something like that, you can, can ask yourself, wow, was I disrespectful externally? Did I say something, you know, wrong or all those kind of things. But then the other part of it is the internal work. So how come this is making me feel so anxious? How come I'm feeling ashamed? I know I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I giving him my power to define me? I know it's not true. I didn't say that. And yet I'm feeling like a little girl who's getting scolded, right? What do I need to do to learn to handle that differently next time? Because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm shrinking, even if I'm still standing outside strong, externally, inside. And so there might be some ways that God is using this moment in your life to help you get stronger, maybe not even with this person anymore. You might not have a relationship with this person anymore, but there's always people like that. There's always people like that and they are going to push your buttons. And so as they push your buttons and you might be handling yourself just fine on the outside, but you feel yourself on the inside doing some stuff, that's where it's really important to say, Lord, this is for my good in a icky kind of way, right? It's like going to, you know, take chemo. This is for my good in an icky kind of way. I don't like it, but I know I need it. So this is for my good in an icky kind of way. If we can trust God, why am I so rattled by this person's words? What's going on with me? Um, and those are really good questions so that rejection or persecution or whatever form it takes um, can help you understand the next step of the journey that God has for you. What boundaries do I need? Um, what mindset do I, do I need to do? What... Um, what responses might I have in the future so that this doesn't keep going and I let it go so long that it really rattled rattle me? What things can I learn from this? And I think those are really good questions. So nothing's ever wasted. God is using something in our life. So one of the things he uses for me to learn patience is traffic jams and long lines. I hate those things. I hate being stopped where I'm going. If I'm going somewhere, I want to get there as quickly as possible, whether it's to the grocery store and out or to the store and back, whatever. And so when there's obstacles like long lights and slow lines and traffic jams, all of the things out there in life that I can't change, I can't change them. The only thing I can change is, oh yeah, Lord, you're teaching me that I can't control everything. And when I can't control something, the only person I can control is me. And I'm not like outwardly, like nobody, if they looked in my window would think I was having a meltdown, but inwardly I'm telling myself stories like, this is ridiculous. And why does this have to take so long? And I need to get back because I'm going to have to, I'm going to be behind in my work. And I'm telling myself all these stories just quietly to myself. I'm still driving. And the Lord's talking to me too. And he's saying, Leslie, you know, a different script. Okay, Lord, I'm going to change the channel. What can I be thankful for? I don't have to be stressed out. I can control me. I can't control this. And those little exercises on those little orps in my day and those little seemingly insignificant events have helped me tremendously to learn to go with the flow and practice patience. Yeah. But it's practicing in the ickies. <laughs> I know. I, Leslie, I love it. One of the best phrases I think you've ever taught me and mm -hmm. our, our, our sisters is what's my problem with that problem or his problem yeah. or that traffic jam or the, <laughs> what's my problem with the traffic jam? Oh, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. It goes back to the whole idea of what we're challenging us to do for these five days. It's like, mm -hmm. we can only focus on ourselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a problem. And then why am I reacting to that? So what's my problem with that? Because right. if you just like the 31 flavors of ice cream, I bet you, you, if you ask 31 different people, well, how do you see that problem? How do you see that problem? 
we're going to get just as many different responses, right? right? So mm -hmm. what what's it on me to do this? And we challenge you to do the challenge because yeah. it'd be such a benefit. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, you'll feel empowered because you're actually doing something about it for yourself and for the greater good of yourself, your family, or whatever your reasons are, especially the Lord. Mm -hmm. Jen, there's one more question that came through that I want to give you a chance to answer. So okay. um, I know you need to go, how do I detach and separate myself in a respectful and compassionate way, but not get hooked on emotions and fear? Yeah. Well, isn't that the $6 million, $60 million question? For sure. So we definitely have um, lots of resources um, that Leslie can offer. But in particular, um, I like I said earlier, is when we can just step back and first notice what's happening in us. I, I, I've said this a couple of times already this week, and I'll say it again. To me, the noticing part is like painting a room where it's, you know, the prep work is 90% of what you need to do. Okay. We want to all just get to the end result and change the color and feel that wow factor when we walk in the room, but the actual prep work of painting or taping it off and doing all those things we need to go do, buying the stir sticks, picking the colors is the hard work. And I think I'm seeing that in, even in your question right now, I know it may not answer it right away, but the fact that you're aware and even asking this question is huge. And then with that noticing gives you a chance to pause to tap into things like this or the challenge, or like I said, Leslie's materials, obviously his word goes first and foremost so that you can choose the next right response because that's where um, it may be 90% to just notice something, but the other 10% is, is so powerful to recognize how it is that you want to show up and be your best, biggest self for the Lord going forward. So I know that doesn't answer it exactly right away. I'll turn it over to Leslie for something more pragmatic, but this is a bit of a journey and we want you to know that we're here for you as you go through it. Yeah. Yeah. So I pulled out my whiteboard, so I'm going to draw a picture that might be helpful to you. So we've talked today about our thoughts Okay, and the stories that we tell ourselves. And we've talked today about our feelings and the feelings of, you know, anger or shame or getting overwhelmed. So, so if we have these parts of us, there's another part of us that we've talked about, but I haven't really drawn, and that's this part of us. And we'll call this your self, okay? This is who you are, all right? And we define this by your two Vs. What are your virtues, greatest virtues, and what are your highest values, okay? So you said, I want to be respectful. So these aren't feelings and thoughts, they're, they're, they're virtues. I wanna be respectful and I wanna be compassionate. That's who I am, I want to be these things. And you could fill this in with things that you wanna be, okay? I wanna be a good mother, whatever you wanna be. They're not feelings, I wanna be courageous. They're values and virtues. I'll move over so you can see this. I'm not a great writer like this. So I wanna be respectful, I wanna be compassionate. And so I'm going to have, I want to detach from someone else um, in a respectful and compassionate way, but not get hooked on emotions. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're saying, I don't wanna get hooked here. All right, so this is really important. By separating these, this is all, so this is in our mind, this is in our body, right? And this is in our, in our will and on our heart. And what I mean by heart is when God calls it the desires of our heart. Our desires of our heart aren't our emotions. They're what we want to be mm -hmm. or what we value most. Those are the desires of our heart, okay? So what happens is you have thoughts. And today you learned, this part of you learned, Oh, some of my thoughts are not facts. They're just scary stories. And that was really helpful for you because, wow, once I see that I'm just having scary stories, I'm not having the same emotional reactions because our thoughts impact our feelings, right? So once I realize that some of my thoughts are scary stories or untrue stories, I can stop thinking them because they're not true. And then I won't have those horrible feelings of rejection like I had before, like I'm not enough and all that, all right? So we've done that today. 
and you notice that you were having that as we talked about it. Now, when you're detaching and detaching means in our vocabulary, really, I don't need your approval. I don't need your love. I like it. I don't need you to be honest in order for me to be okay. So you're detaching from your big N-E-E-D, I need something from you in order for me to be okay. You're detaching from that. And that's a healthy thing to do. So when you notice, oh, my feelings are getting mad and my feelings are getting sad. My feelings are about, I want to be respectful and compassionate, but I'm tempted to let him know how I feel. And I'm going to use a few choice words to let him have, you know, knowledge that he is whatever you're going to say, but that's not very respectful and compassionate, right? So you're noticing this in a nanosecond, just like you notice your story. I notice that I'm having feelings and I don't want them to control me. I want to control me. I have my feelings. My feelings don't have me. All right. You're following me. So what do I do? This is the thing that you have to recognize. All of us have capacity limits. And what I mean by that is that you may want to stay awake all night because you're driving and that's important to you to get your mother's for Christmas. And you notice that you're falling asleep at the wheel, all right? So you know that you're running out of capacity to do this well because you're gonna, your body's gonna take over and fall asleep, all right? We only have limited capacity. So when you're at emotional capacity, like I'm gonna blurt, I'm gonna vomit, then you need to take a break from the conversation. You need to get out of the conversation and take care of you. Just like you need to stop driving and take care of you. Sleep, do what you need to do so that you can do the driving in the way that you wanna do it without causing an accident, all right? So we all understand this physically, and um, we've talked about this before. All of you know how to manage your urine. Nobody's peeing on themselves these days. If you're mature, a mature, healthy adult, even a mature, healthy kindergartner is not peeing on themselves. They've learned to know their capacity. I can hold my urine till recess. I can hold my urine for 10 more minutes. I'm going to have to ask the teacher that I can get excused, right? We know that now. We have our capacity. We are not going to dishonor ourselves by stretching our capacity beyond our ability to bear, right? In the same way, emotionally, you know what your capacity is. You might grow your capacity. Like I've grown my capacity for patience, right? I've grown my capacity for patience because you can grow your capacity, but it's not limitless. It's not limitless. Mm -hmm. So if I feel like I am stressed out to the point of I'm going to say some ugly things and all that, I have to, I have to get alone. I have to get out of the stress. And if I don't, I'll probably lose my capacity. Just like if I'm walking and I can't hold my urine anymore, I'm probably going to pee my pants. If I'm out in the woods and I'm hiking and I can't get back to the toilet, I'm going to pee in the woods. I'm just going to do it because I'm out of capacity. Right. So understand that this is how we work. And as long as you to answer your question, as long as you recognize that when my emotions are reaching capacity that I can't contain them anymore, I need to separate myself from the conversation so that I can regroup. OK, mm -hmm. so that was a long way of saying those <laughs> things. But I thought the diagram might help you to visualize how to do it. It was brilliant. And you're getting good feedback, too, about the analogy, because I was told when I first went my for I went for my first ultrasound for my first baby. And I was told, you know, you have to hold your urine in order to make it effective. I was told I had to actually go and relieve myself because I was so, quote unquote, good at it, holding that capacity. And the tech said to me, you must be a nurse or a teacher. And I went, I'm a nurse. Like, how did you even know? But that put the expectation on me that I'm expected to even go beyond that capacity. But it wasn't healthy for me. Right. See? So we have to learn that. I yeah, love you get that. bladder infections when you hold it too long. Sure. So, so your body is saying there's a time to release, yeah. time to sleep. And if you're not paying attention, we're just going to take over. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to pee yourself. You're going to fall asleep at the wheel. <laughs> so understand you have capacities. And we, like I said, mm -hmm. we can grow our capacity, but we don't have, that's part of accepting our humanity. We're limit. We're limited. Yeah. We're limited creatures and we're not God. And so he's not expecting us to take it and take it and take it and take it. We have capacity and get ourselves to a place of safety or understand and forgive ourselves. If we pee ourselves in public, it's not that we wanted to, or even threw up in public, we couldn't get to the toilet and it just happened. We, we have capacity and there's, it's going to come out when we can't stop. Okay. That's <laughs> yeah. So, and understand what your triggers are and get your, you always have, you know, if you were in a conversation with someone 
who was, you know, you were reaching capacity with your urine or your bowel movement, you wouldn't say, please let me stop and go to the bathroom. You would just say, I need to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. And most people understand that in those physical terms. And they wouldn't say, no, you have to stay here. They would say, oh, okay, go. In the same way, emotionally, you don't have to tell the person who's ragging on you or who you have to detach from that emotionally I'm at capacity because they're going to mock you for that. Just say, I have to go to the bathroom. Just say, I have to go to the bathroom. That's good enough information. And go to the bathroom and call, cry or go to the bathroom and breathe and calm yourself down or whatever. And then come out and say, I'm not feeling well. I have to go home or I have to go to bed. You don't have to continue the conversation if you're at capacity. And you don't owe anyone a specific explanation. Yeah. All right. Warning lights on. Yeah. Risa says warning lights for sure. Your warning, your body gives you warning, warning lights, lights on. <laughs> I have to run. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you everyone for this. And I've got so many notes myself. I don't even know how I keep up, but thank you. Thank you all. You're See welcome. You. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for all your wisdom. All right. We are going to do a Facebook live. I think again, tomorrow it's June 13th at 12 PM Eastern time. And we're going to follow up with this. Do you find yourself switching ice cream flavors just to be liked? Do you find yourself agreeing with others just so they won't? And in this culture, it's pretty hard. I rode a bus from Prescott, where my house is in the summer, uh, to here, or to airport, actually, because I had to go to North Carolina. And there were two ladies who were on, I was sitting in the middle, and they were on each side of me in the bus, in the shuttle bus. And they were talking politics and they were saying things that I just couldn't agree with. And finally, I just had to speak up for myself. <laughs> they didn't know who I was. I was just an old lady in the bus, but I was saying, I don't agree with that. Blah, 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 you know, and, and what was neat about it, I mean, I did it in a respectful way. I didn't, you know, argue with them, but it was interesting because one of the ladies said, wow, I never thought about that. And that's the point of having conversations with people who disagree with you is that you didn't think about things that they thought about. So do you find yourself just shutting down or saying things just to agree with people or not saying what you really think because you're afraid of not being liked? I have done that. I have done that. I did some. I remember being and I'll just share the story. And then we're going to close for tomorrow. This is our I'll probably share it tomorrow. I remember being at a women's conference when I was newly married. I was probably 30. I had a child. At I think I had one child at the time, maybe two, but I think I only had one. And the woman speaker was a rabid Bill Gothard fan. And she was rabid on, you know, the role, wife of, role of a wife is to be submissive. And, and she used the story. She said, I had a friend who was pregnant and her husband didn't want the baby and he wanted her to have an abortion and she didn't want to have an abortion. She knew that wasn't God, but she had to submit to her husband because that's what God told her to do. So he's driving her to the abortion clinic and guess what? Praise God. She had a spontaneous miscarriage. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> but I was not brave enough to just stand up and call her out on that craziness. I knew it was crazy. I knew it wasn't biblical at the time, but I didn't have the courage to call her out. So are you afraid? Not only because he wouldn't like me, but all of my conservative Christian Gothard fans wouldn't like my, my not my fans, his fans uh, wouldn't like me either. And so where do you stay silent? Because you're afraid, because you're afraid people won't like you. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. All right. So goodbye for now. I will see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.